When you turn on the TV set to watch the news, it can be very depressing. The nation states in the African Union try to resolve the pressing issues of that region. Ebola, poverty and the rise of terrorism. In the European Union, delegates of the member states discuss the rise of unemployment, the horrible war in the Ukraine and security in the region where they want to monitor name records, bank details, mobile numbers and meal preferences on everyone flying in and out of that region. The Arab League probably has the biggest weight on their hands. It is a very unstable region with wars and conflicts in Egypt, Syria, Iraq, etc. and ISIL. Not a easy job to deal with. The United Nations is heavily focused on climate change. And Hollywood actors like Leonardo DiCaprio, who glorifies wars in their films, seems to focus on climate change rather than dealing with conflict zones. The Vatican has also joined the climate change bandwagon, trying to make herself relevant to the modern world, giving people the false impression that she cares for humanity. The entertainment industry has also played a central and key role, reaching both children and adults on this environmental earth worship agenda, and the strong voices in popular culture will lend a voice to this cause. I want to invite uh, the legendary uh, artist, beloved uh, uh, creative uh, artist, Pharrell Williams, who is the creative director of Live Earth, to join me on stage. There will be an audience of two billion, the largest television, digital, radio network ever created, uh, all as one. But we literally are going to have humanity harmonize all at once. The purpose is to have a billion voices with one message. What are the philosophies of Pharrell Williams and Al Gore? Is it God-centered or nature worship-centered? Al Gore in his book, Earth in the Balance, said, A growing number of anthropologists and archaeologists, such as Marija Gimbatas and Rian Eisler, argue that the prevailing ideology of belief in prehistoric Europe and much of the world was based on the worship of a single earth goddess who was assumed to be the fount of all life and who radiated harmony among all living things. It seems obvious that a better understanding of religious heritage preceding our own by so many thousands of years could offer us new insight into the nature of the human experience. Pharrell Williams has the exact same New Age views as Al Gore, birds of a feather shall flock together. And in an interview with GQ Style magazine, the English edition in 2013, he said, I believe in God and the universe, and that these are synonymous, that they are basically the same thing. I'm no theologian. On paper, I'm a Christian but really I'm a universalist. I believe there are many different routes to a destination. Do I think that Christianity is the only way? No. So this let's help the earth and humanity agenda takes God totally out of the picture. Can there really be a solution to all the world's conflicts, including the problems that exist even in the churches? Yes, there is. Edward Alexander Sutherland was a brilliant educator and wrote a book in 1900 titled Living Fountains or Broken Systems, and he gives the solution. Again, the second great commandment, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, is the statement of a principle which underlies all history civil government and political and social science. If 
followed, it will solve all international difficulties as well as prevent personal animosity. It will blot out the evils of society, breaking down the barrier between poverty and riches. Trust would never exist, trade unions would be unnecessary and monopolies unknown if the one law of Jehovah were only learned. Of how much greater value then is the study of such principle than all the theories which may be proposed by men for international arbitration or the laws which may be passed in legislative halls concerning the equal rights of men and the proper means of governing states, territories or acquired possessions. But do men really want peace via Christ? Nope. The late Manly Palmer Hall, a respected esoteric scholar and a high-ranking Freemason, summed up the world's problems in a few words. Selfishness is the fundamental cause of all worldly evil. When we look through the hourglass of time, the Bible, unlike other sacred and secular texts, not only tells us how the world started, but forewarns us in detail the spiritual condition of the planet just before it will end. Bible prophecy, especially in the book of Revelation, is Jesus guiding his church through time from the church of Ephesus to the church of Laodicea, where he walks among the seven branch candlestick that represents his church to prepare them for the final assault on the planet that will be led by the great dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. But he, Satan, is openly preparing minds for war through the enticing power of celluloid entertainment. While war is emotionally and economically draining, it is being so highly glamorized in the United States, a nation that has been prophesied whose one and only mission on the prophetic charter is to make the entire planet worship an even older power, the papacy. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Vice President, members of Congress, my fellow Americans. My first duty as Commander-in-Chief is to defend the United States of America. In doing so, the question is not in doing so, the question is not whether America leads in the world, but how. As His Holiness Pope Francis has said, diplomacy is the work of small steps. Hello. What a pleasure to see you. How are you? Fine. Thank you. And you? Really happy to see you. Monsignor Pietro Barolin welcomed U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry for a very brief meeting at the Vatican. The object of prophecy is not to focus on these systems, the two kingdoms, but for Jesus' flock to get their lives right, to have the character of Christ which is rooted in humility and love, or the character of Satan which is jealousy and selfishness. And this study will look at the most important area of study in the Christian experience, faith. What is faith and how do we acquire it? When we look at all the madness and dramas going on in the world, I know for some people it can be very discouraging where anytime you turn on the news, there's always some kind of misery taking place. But if there's one thing we have to have under our belt, it's an area of study which is highly ignored. In order for us to stand as individuals, we need to know how to exercise faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, it gives the hall of fame of men who were faithful to God throughout the ages. You had a murderer like Moses, a drunkard like Noah, and an adulterer like David. What is beautiful about God is that he did not focus on their failings. He looked at where they failed in their life, but he still canonized them because they stayed faithful to the end. In this study, we're going to look at faith. How do we develop faith? and how we'll be able to stand 
in one of the most trying times in Earth history. As we go through this study, we'll find out how. Modern day satellites and their huge lenses have given us a greater understanding of the starry sky in the heavens. From time immemorial, the ancients have watched in absolute awe the hundreds, thousands and billions of objects in space, trying to interpret them and even believing that departed spirits from their dead relatives resided there. But how did they all get there? The 16th century English Bible scholar William Tyndale said, Read the 11th chapter to the Hebrews for thy consolation. The 11th chapter of Hebrews when describing our universe says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. How did the book of Hebrews describe the patriarchs and matriarchs who depended upon God's word till death? It reads, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. If they were pilgrims, what were they seeking or looking for? But now they desire a better country, that is, in heaven, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. But if they died in faith seeking a heavenly country, when will they get to see that better place? Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. At the first resurrection. William Tyndale believed in the first resurrection and directed us to the book of Hebrews to understand faith. But how do we get faith? Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The best example of faith, surprisingly, is not by a believer, but by a pagan, where there was a dialogue between a Roman soldier and Jesus Christ. Roman soldiers were followers of the god Mithras, but this false pagan deity was no match to the great physician. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, which is the village of Nahum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Jesus said that the best example of faith was not a Jew, but a Gentile where he openly displayed that true faith is believing that God's word can accomplish exactly what it said it can do. And when an individual accepts Christ, he or she needs to learn that they are a soldier in a spiritual battle. And one of the weapons is faith. The Holy Scripture says, Put on the whole arm of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles or tricks of the devil. And one of these weapons in our spiritual armour is, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all, not some, but all the fiery darts of the wicked. Sir Charles Leonard Woolley was a British archaeologist. In his travels throughout Iraq, 
he uncovered a city called Ur of the Chaldees, and he documented it in a book that he published in 1929. The artifacts uncovered shows a very highly civilized race of people with a high level of art and metallurgy. And while modern day secular science embarrassingly searches the geological records for a missing link, the science of archaeology has accurately identified the peoples and places in the Bible. Ur of the Chaldees was the birthplace of the patriarch Abraham. But by faith he left, for he looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. It was a culture that was dominated by self-worship, the worship of man, serpent worship, the deification of Satan, sun worship, the belief that the ball of fire in the heavens was the one supreme God, and sexual worship, where, like today, a woman's body was used to advertise nearly every product. It was a culture dominated by nature worship. Today it has been renamed as Darwinism. On this cylinder seal, Shamash, the sun god is rising between two mountains, who is helped by Mother Nature, Ishtar, on the left, where second from the right, Ea or Enki, the water god, has a river of fish flowing from him. Though US troops now occupy the birthplace of Abraham, many are unaware that this Babylonian province is still impacting our modern culture till this very day. The Lord speaking through the prophet Jeremiah said, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Sir Ernest Alfred Thomas Wallace Budge was an orientalist, philologist, one of the foremost Egyptologists of the 20th century, who was sometime keeper of Egyptian and Assyrian antiquities in the British Museum, whose scholarly research on the ancient records was fascinating. He said that the Sumerians and Babylonians believed that the will of the gods in respect to man and his affairs could be learned by watching the motions of the stars and planets, and that skilled stargazers could obtain from the motions and varying aspects of the heavenly bodies indications of future prosperity and calamity, have formed the foundation of the astrology in use in the world for the last 5,000 years. Abraham left this city of astrologers, sorcerers, magicians and stargazers, but the belief that the stars in the heavens influence our lives still runs deep in our modern day western culture. The astrological gods like Leo the lion, the first sign of the zodiac is still around today, Pisces the double fish is still around today, the constellation of Capricorn the goat, Sagittarius or Nimrod the mighty hunter shooting an arrow with his bow, and Scorpio the eighth astrological sign in the zodiac. From Babylon to Rome these pagan gods are still well alive and in use today. Manly Palmer Hall knew how influential Babylonian culture was and he recorded one of its influences in our world today. The average person does not even suspect the occult properties of the emblematic pentacles. The pentagram or five-pointed star made of five connected lines is the time-honored symbol of the magical arts and signifies the five properties of the great magical agent, the five senses of man, the five elements of nature, the five extremities of the human body. The pentagram is used extensively in black magic. A pentagram from ancient Babylon is on display in the Babylonian section of the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, Germany the highest symbol in the occult. John Dee, the 16th century English mathematician, astronomer, occultist and advisor to Queen Elizabeth I, personal insignia was the pentagram that is still on display in London's British Museum. This Masonic temple in central London also has a five-pointed star on the floor in front of one of its doors. 
This Catholic church in East of London has a pentagram in its window. And in entertainment, the film Season of the Witch, starring Nicolas Cage that also promotes the Church of Rome and witchcraft, has a pentagram. And in modern day music, Kesha dances in the front of a pentagram in her song. And R. Kelly has a pentagram medallion around his neck in his cheap, sleazy, sexually graphic video. In a book titled Chaldean Astrology and Magic, it documents that Babylonian religion was based on fear. You can see that this god Pazuzu, the most feared deity, is real ugly. And he was called, like Satan in the Bible, the Lord of the Air. Pazuzu got a facelift in 1973 in another promotion of the Catholic Church and the Jesuit Order. The film known as the most scariest movie of all time, The Exorcist where the young girl is possessed by a demon, the Babylonian deity, Pazuzu. It is true when Solomon said there is no new thing under the sun. But educator Edward Alexander Sutherland gives us a brilliant commentary on why Abraham left a land of idolatry in faith from the city life to enjoy country living in nature. In Ur, God said, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and will make thy name great. Those who wished to worship the true God gathered about the tents of Abraham and became pupils in his school. God's word was the basis of all instruction. This word was the basis for the study of political science. The equality of all men was a lesson first learned in the home. All were taught that they were under the rule of the God of heaven. The Bible is very clear that we are all children of Abraham if we accept Christ's invitation to eternity in our hearts. But when was that promise first given? Now the Lord said unto Abraham, who later were called Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. When was that prophecy fulfilled? When Paul was speaking to the Northern European Celtic Gaelic culture, the Galatians, he said to them, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. But how do we become the spiritual seed of Abraham? In a letter to the Mediterranean culture in Rome and southern Europe, he said to them, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but to the righteousness of faith. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not the only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. The Holy Scriptures continues and is unequivocally clear that, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, less, which means in case, any man should boast. But though we know that it is by faith and not by our own merits or works, do we not need work to exercise that faith? James says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So when we give up our fallen nature to be partakers of the divine nature, the Bible describing the transition from the old to the new life says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Sanctification means to be made holy. And justification means you are acquitted of sin 
when you accept Christ's sacrifice. So we are both sanctified and justified together. The scripture says, To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they might receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. The letter to the Romans says, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are both sanctified and justified by faith. It is absolutely imperative that we study faith, for it is the only thing that will keep you and save you in the winding down of world events in Bible prophecy. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh or has victory or conquers the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. When the final global decree will be passed upon the entire earth, there will only be one group of people who will stand and be faithful to Christ. And Revelation says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Their lives will be modeled after the divine pattern, the heavenly blueprint. But overlooking the Tiber River beyond the Alpine mountains is a system that is cleverly trying to undermine the oldest principle given to mankind, faith. And they are ever so cleverly trying to undermine the Protestant Reformation. The 16th century English reformer William Tyndale said that all the world knoweth that Martin Luther slayeth no man but killeth only with the spiritual sword, the word of God. When the Augustinian German monk nailed the 95 Theses in 1517 as a protest to the authority of the doctrine of the papacy and taught justification by faith, it catapulted a movement that already started in 14th century England and half of the continent of Western Europe was severed from papal control. But the modern day Lutherans who have lost sight of their own scriptural heritage are now uniting with the papal whore of Babylon. And 2017 will be the 500th anniversary of that protest. And the Lutheran union with Rome is designed to completely topple it. And when men say, the protest is over, they are laying the groundwork for unification with Rome as this conversation between a Jesuit priest and a former Calvinist convert to Catholicism confirms. There's one core doctrine, one core idea that every Protestant ought to answer for themselves, okay? And if, once you raise the question, I think it points you inevitably to the Catholic Church. How do you know what the Christian faith is? How do you know what the Christian faith is? Now, instantly the Protestant says, well, no, because the Bible tells me. All right, well, who told you that that's where you should go to answer this question? Who told you? Did Jesus tell us the Bible is our rule of faith? Right. Now, once you raise the question, instantly you know, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. Jesus said that he was the final authority. He, he frequently invoked his own authority over against that of the Old Testament. You've heard that it's written, but I say to you. Um, and then when he ascended into heaven, he gave that interpretive authority to his apostles. He said, I have all authority, you therefore go into all nations and make disciples. And whoever hears you hears me, whoever uh, rejects you rejects me. And then the very earliest Christians understood that as referring to the apostolic succession of bishops, St. Ignatius of Antioch in the second century. So, quoting the Gospel of Luke says, we have to hear those who Christ sent as Christ himself, namely the bishop. And so the question is, how do you know what the Christian faith is? Well, you know by looking to the rule of faith that Christ gave us. He gave us the teaching church, the magisterium of the teaching church to answer that question. All you have to do is ask, did Jesus tell us the Bible alone? You can search the scriptures from cover to cover. You'll never find Jesus saying, if you have a, a doctrinal question, go to the Bible alone. No, he pointed us to no. the teaching church. And, and St. Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2.15 says, hold on to the traditions which I left you, Absolutely. whether by word or by letter. One of my favorite passages in the church fathers is from Tertullian, 
uh, the North African theologian. He writes a book called The Prescription Against Heretics. And then uh, he actually looks at this question, if I have a theological question, should I look to the Bible alone for an answer? He raises this as a possibility. Is the Bible alone a sufficient rule of faith? And he automatically says no. He rejects that idea. Why? Well, for the obvious reason that different groups have different interpretations of Scripture. It, it, history shows it's not a sufficient rule of faith. How do you know what the Christian faith is? And Tertullian says the only way you know is you go to the churches founded by apostles that are in apostolic succession. What is the faith that those churches teach and hold? That's the way you know what the Christian faith is. And it's only the interpretation of Scripture that lines up with that rule of faith that is to be accepted. And of course, when you move to Irenaeus, he, he identifies the, the premier church, of course, is the Church of Rome. Let us carefully analyze this man's arguments. Jesus didn't do away with the Old Testament. He confirmed that it verified who he is. Search the scriptures, the Old Testament, Jesus says, for in them we think ye have eternal life, and that they are they which testify of me. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Paul confirmed that the foundation of God's church is built upon Jesus, the Old Testament and the writing of the apostles which was writing at that time and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together, that is God's people, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Should we look to the magisterium or the authority of the church as our rule of faith? Well, let's see again what saith Paul. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And Paul was only making a confirmation of what Jesus already said. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, Jesus said, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock, and that rock is Christ. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not. Why? For it was founded upon a rock. So Jesus is clear. If your foundation is on his words and his words alone, nothing can shake you, especially the winds. But what are these winds? That we henceforth or from this time forward be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine or false unscriptural teaching by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lay in wait to deceive. Jesus is very clear that his words alone will not only guide us into eternity but will distinguish who are his true followers. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But what is truth? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Jesus confirms that his word is the true rule of faith. But now this man attacks Luther and the Reformation. Um, a good example is on the question of salvation. When, when Luther comes up with this idea of salvation by faith alone, he recognizes that that, that runs smack up against the teaching of Jesus. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you know, do this or else. He gives us a lot of imperatives. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Luther has to come up with this whole convoluted method of basically explaining away the teaching of Jesus so he can hold to his doctrine of faith alone. 
This man is teaching so much blatant error. It was Jesus who restored the teaching of righteousness by faith. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing or having faith in, ye shall receive. The brilliant Protestant scholar J. A. Wiley adds a brilliant commentary on the teaching of faith in his first thesis, The Papacy. He said that Protestantism is old truth. Popery is medieval error. The cardinal truth of Luther's teaching was justification by faith alone. This truth Luther certainly did not invent. It was the very truth which Paul preached to Jew and Gentile. Therefore we conclude, says Paul, writing to the Church of Rome, that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. This was the truth which was revealed to the patriarchs and proclaimed by the prophets. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached the gospel before unto Abraham. The doctrine of Protestants then is just Christianity, and Christianity is as old as the world. That Christianity Luther did not invent, he was simply God's instrument to summon it from the grave to which Popery had consigned it. Faith is one of the master faculties of the soul. It is indispensable to strength of purpose, grandeur of aim, and that indomitable, persevering effort which guides to success. For those who are truly and sincerely seeking and searching for God, as the advice is always given, research and go over everything that was presented in the study, and develop your faith in Christ and his word now for when the heat gets turned up no pastor no church organization family or friend can save you it will only be your faith